bunga, bunga, bunga. Okay, so as of today, I've pretty much played this game every day since it came out. I started off on day one with a classic strength build which suits my playstyle the best and took my time exploring as much of the map as possible and collecting as many items and equipment along the way before I went through the final end game portion and watched those sweet credits roll. Thanks for the memories, pubis. But that wasn't enough, so I decided to do it all again, this time with my lady mage just following the main boss pathway and side quest I missed the first time. Now somehow, after a total of two completions with different endings over the course of two completely different builds, I still wasn't bored. And I mean, I was 180 hours deep at this point. I don't know what f***ing day it was, I smelled like shit. What a game. So, I thought, let's up the ante a bit. Which led me to this strapping young lad. This is Byron. Oonga Boonga! Oonga Boonga Byron. Oonga Boonga Oonga Boonga! And he is my first ever challenge run build. Sort of. I like to call this the Unga Bunga Caveman Challenge Run. Let's go over the rules for this here challenge run, shall we? Right, we all sitting comfortably. Good. Rule one, strike weapons only. You can use bows, that's fine. You can't use spells or any shit like that, okay? If it says strike, it's fine. If it doesn't say strike, then whoop, out the window. Number two, no flask of wondrous physic. No, no relying on buffs or Adderall or fucking steroids or any shit like that, right? It's not the Unga Bunga way, okay? We're all natural. Rule number three, no summons, except for the few NPCs that are pretty much required in order to defeat certain bosses. Rule number four, no rune arcs. Rule number five, no clothing or armor, except for the Unga Bunga horns, obviously. Number six, no shields. The best defense is a good offense, and we're going fully offensive at this build. Rule number seven, Bestial incantations only, because we're a beast and we're the best, so it only makes sense. And last but not least, rule number eight, the most important one of the f***ing lot. No bitching. It's a long hard road ahead, and this isn't the glass of warm milk and afternoon nap challenge run, okay? With all these rules laid out, let's wipe those precious tears away and talk about some of the things we can do. So you can still upgrade your weapons and use Ashes of War to increase the scaling stats, but no cheesing. Cheesy equals sleazy. You can still manage and swap out all your favourite talismans. You can still dual wield your strike weapons. You can still use as many healing flasks with as many upgrades to them as you like. So go nuts and drink yourself to death. Get glugging. Don't forget about the best deal incantations. They can be fast, use minimal FP, and like the bow, they're useful in many situations. You can still level up as much as you like. So if you really do hit a brick wall, go and smash some low level enemies and rack up some runes. There's also nothing wrong with going on the Elden Ring wiki and making yourself a little shopping list of all the different weapons and talismans that you want in their locations for this run before you start going after all the juicy bosses. This challenge run is hard enough, and I assume if you hate yourself enough to actually attempt this then you've already completed it and don't need to explore the whole f***ing lands between again. Plus, it'll give you a good sense of direction at the start. Now you may be thinking, how is this fun? Why would anyone want to do this? Well, I'm going to quickly convince you why. But first, I need to explain a few small things relevant to this build. The first thing is Equip Load. Now, Equip Load is determined by the total weight of all gear and items you have equipped, which will land you in one of four states. The first state is Light Load. This will give you the longest amount of invincibility that you get during a roll, whilst costing less stamina and covering more distance. The second is Medium Load, then Heavy Load, and then Overloaded. The next thing we need to talk about is strike damage. A weapon that does strike damage will eventually break an enemy's stance, leaving them wide open for a critical hit. Each enemy has an invisible meter known as super armor that decreases when you hit them and slowly recovers over time. Think of this like a stamina and health bar combined. If you hit them enough times to reduce their super armor to zero, their stance will break and they will drop to their knees sobbing so you can grab them by the scruff of their neck and smash their f***ing face in. So because we have a light load and are primarily dealing strike damage, we're forced to be as aggressive as we can whilst bouncing around like a ninja with a pogo stick on a trampoline in a bouncy castle the size of Stormvale. And that is why this build is so much fun. It's also why this challenge run is going to force you to get good, as the saying goes. You need to learn the movesets of every enemy, so that when the time comes that you actually beat these dweebs, you're not even going to need a shield. You're not even going to need your flasks. You're going to be all like, huh, still had six flasks. Holy shit, I only used two flasks. I might pawn on my old flask with some shiny runes to just take up valuable space in my inventory and I don't need that fucking shit in my life anymore. Right, that's all the theory out of the way. So here's a bunch of mental fights from the bosses I've done so far. Uh, 
Okay, first up we have a great golden good boy go getter Godric the Grafted. I didn't get much clean footage of the first few bosses as I wasn't really taking this playthrough too seriously at the start and having played through the game twice already, they weren't that challenging. You see, when I fought Margaret and Godric the first time, they were very difficult to me, so I spent a lot of time fighting them and ended up memorising a lot of their attacks because of that. This softened the blow a little when going at it again with Byron, booga, booga. so it was mostly just a case of staying out of their way and being patient, which was really fun because by the time I beat them I felt so in control of the fight. A big table turner was discovering if you sprint straight towards him at the very start of phase 2 when he uses his giant flamethrower you can swiftly get behind him for some cheeky tickles. It wasn't until I fell in love with this build that I decided to start recording more and make this video so you'll notice the footage getting better as we progress. I beat Margit with double clubs and trust me when I say it was hilarious, I summoned Rogier who got absolutely punished while I prodded Margit from behind until he eventually died. At this point I was playing with the intention of not levelling up any of my weapons, so I had to ditch the double clubs for double morning stars instead, thanks to a friend giving me a spare one. I quickly realised that keeping this rule in place would make the rest of the game way too hard to still be enjoyable, and made good friends with Smithing Master Cube for some upgrades. After beating Godric, I swiftly made my way to Lyurnia to kick down the doors of Rhea Lucaria. I don't have any footage for the Renala fight, but I can tell you it was pretty tough. Luckily, she's a freak for bleed damage though, so I just went in as aggressive as I could until I got lucky. This guy on the other hand... This f***ing guy... Now although I didn't look it from the footage, it took me hours to kill that piece of shit. The Draconic Tree Sentinel was the first brick wall boss that I came across that felt ridiculous and made me want to cry into my Teletubbies pillow and play Nintendogs for the rest of my life. You fucking see that shit? Scammed, I tell you. Scammed!
Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Boom! See ya, bitch. Yeah! I was really struggling at this point of the game, so I felt pretty good about that little victory. But then I did this. Oh, oh, oh. Shit. I didn't get any footage of Godfrey, but it was pretty straightforward. I've kind of found him to be basic all three times now. He's just so slow and easy to dodge. I think this is intentional, but I'll explain why if I make a part two. I also felt kind of bad for not having any Radagon footage, so I went back to another location where I knew I could fight him again, which was when I accidentally stumbled across this utter nail biter. Eat shit, you mangy fuck. Well, there it is, my journey so far. We've watched poor young Byron go from a rolling pin bush boy to a dumbbell wooden dodge lord. I'm currently stuck on another brick wall boss, but if you want to see more in a part two, then let me know in the comments and I'll crack on. Don't forget to like, subscribe, ding the bell, dodge roll, charge attack, and traverse the mist 300 times so you finally beat one boss and crash Tinder. Goodbye from me, and goodbye from Byron. Oonga boonga! And maybe I'll see you in the next one. Maybe.